everybody. It's not on information overload yet. That comes tomorrow, right? <laughs> you all had a wonderful lunch, and we're all bright-eyed and pushy tail. Nice warm room. Okay. This is open source versus network attackers. What's in your arsenal? I'm Gary Smith. I work at the Northwest National Laboratory, which is over in eastern Washington. That's the dry side of the state. We get like five inches of rain a year. Come over there. I'll, I'll show you. <laughs> um, we, but we also have 400 days of sunshine every year. Some people actually caught that. Good. <laughs> Um, the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory is a Department of Energy laboratory. Uh, we do lots of things there. I'm part of the Environmental Molecular Science Laboratory, where we do environmental molecular science. Gee, what a coincidence. Um, we have a large supercomputer there because that generates to uh, do things with large amounts of data. Um, I take care of the security for the supercomputer and its infrastructure, but uh, that's not what we're here to talk about today. Uh, these are some of our happy researchers doing wonderful things. Um, maybe you wonder, where do we get ideas for these things that we want to present about? Well, sometimes the idea comes from you. Mr. Paul back there, who videotapes these sessions for us, came up to me last year and said, you know, I'm seeing all of these IP addresses from, I guess, all over the world hitting my router and my firewall and I don't know where these things are coming from and they might, they're obviously, they're trying to break in. Is there something I can do about it? And I said, well, yeah, there's lots of things you can do about it. He said, well, maybe you could do this as a presentation next year. So, here we are. And there he is. So, we're in good shape. Um, that's where we get the ideas. So, uh, a little bit of context. How do you think about security? You kind of have this maybe visceral feeling about it. Here's how I think about security. I think about security with, oh boy, gotta love, gotta love, um, Display functions and uh, <laughs> I that's part of your presentation here. No, 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 that, that blurring is not supposed to be there. Um, that's not presentation yeah. in depth? You know, it doesn't. It's strange. Oh, well. <laughs> we'll, we'll <laughs> we're experiencing technical difficulties, but we'll proceed anyway. What I do is I think about security through what I call the five golden principles of security. <clears throat> And, and for some reason or the other, the order has gotten flipped on me. Actually, the order has gotten shuffled, which is even worse. Um, this one should be the first one. Know your enemy. It's actually down at the bottom. Uh, this one that got kind of superimposed looks kind of screwed up. Okay, the first one is know your system. Know what runs on it. Know who uses it know what type of software is running on it. Um, remember Sun, Sun Systems, before they got bought by Oracle? They used to say, the network is the system. So, you know your network. You know what kind of traffic you have on it. Um, the second one up there, protection is key, but detection is a must. Well, actually, that's not the second one. The second one is actually principle of least privilege. Don't give privilege to users processes, computers, don't more than they absolutely need to have. And this is particularly true of managers. Don't give managers room. Okay. <laughs> does your CEO, does he need to be rude? No. Absolutely not. Okay, the third one is defense and death. Don't employ just one thing and say, I'm secure. Layer your security on top of each other. There's a castle in Fougere, France, I'm fairly familiar with. It has a double moat. It has a moat and then an inner moat. Barbarians come, they manage to breach the first moat. They see the second moat, they say, 
Hey, forget about this. We're going to go to the castle down the street. Too much trouble. You may not, you'll be able to deter a lot of attackers simply because it gets progressively harder to get in. Okay, now, this one's actually in the right place for change. How about that? Protection is key, but detection is a must. You can harden your systems all you want. You can apply patches the minute they come out. But if you don't know that something has gone wrong, you've lost the battle. You have to be able to detect that something has gone wrong. The last one is in the right place. Know your enemy. Know how your enemy is going to attack you. Learn to use his tools. Use your, his tools against you to find out what he may know or may already know. Learn to think like a hacker. Those are the five golden principles of security. That's how I think about security. Okay. So, all these bad guys were beating up on Jay's uh, router and firewall trying to get in through SSH. This is a brute force attack. And all brute force attacks are based on FUD's law, first law of opposition. Anybody remember FUD's first law of opposition? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe you weren't into 70s surreal comedy. Um, FUD's first law of opposition says if you push something long enough and hard enough, it will fall over. That's the principle behind all brute force attack. You pound on something long enough with SSH, eventually you may succeed and find your username and password combination that you can get in on. SSH brute force attacks have been going on for at least 10 years. Maybe longer. I know they've been going on for at least for over 10 years, based on my experience with them. They've been going on for a long time. There is nothing fundamentally different between the SSH attacks of 15 years ago versus what's going on right now today. Somebody is going through a list of usernames and a list of passwords and cross product and they're trying to get in. Same sort of thing. The thing that is different is that 15 years ago, you put up a server on the internet and it's going to sit there, all peaceful and wonderful for any length of time before somebody tries to attack it. Now you put a server up and within minutes it's going to be scanned. I can tell you this is true. This is based on my personal experience. I have put brand new systems up on the internet and within minutes, minutes, it has already been scanned 30 to 40 times on UDP port 137, 138. What are those? Microsoft name serving ports. I can guarantee you this happens. I see it all the time. Minutes. Okay. Um, do you see this when you look through your logs? Oh, yeah. By the way, Anybody here watch cooking shows? Okay. If you notice on the cooking shows, they do all the stuff, and they, they put it in the oven, and then they pull out from the lower rack something that's already been cooked. Okay. This is a, that's, that's the way cooking shows generally work. They don't usually prepare. They usually have something prepared ahead of time to, to pull out. A little bit of fakery there. Unlike cooking shows, what I'm showing you today is not fakery. This is not something I typed in by hand. This is real logs. All the stuff coming from my things today, this is based on real data. This isn't something I hokeyed up. IP addresses coming in, trying a bunch of usernames. Maybe you see that in your logs. Or maybe you see this. This is a. They're doing spoofing on the other end. Yeah. Tell a password. Everybody trying to get in on root. Lots of different IP addresses. Or maybe you see something like this. Admin. 
I submit that whoever this is is doing this, these, these IP addresses here, there's just two of them in this example. I suggest that this is not somebody who's very astute because they should have run a scan against the, um, an NMAX scan with fingerprinting on and seen that this was a Linux system. Admin is a, is a Windows thing. This is probably some script kitty. <laughs> How do you have a default admin username in Windows? Pardon? Admin? Isn't it Windows administrator, isn't it? Yeah. Admin, admin administrator. Admin doesn't one. work in Windows. Admin, admin is usually what I see. What are you trying to do? <laughs> um, there are a couple of the older, like, um, original AIXs and whatnot that had specialized accounts yeah. uh, such as this. Uh, there, back, if you've ever read the Cuckoo's Egg, one of the ones was one that was intended for field service. Yeah. And so it was like F service or something like that. It was and it's, so it's not, or FE or something. Right, and like it's that. not necessarily something that you would think of, but it was intended to basically give field service engineers access to the box to load new drivers and stuff like that. Okay. How do you protect against something like this? Where do you start? Change the Keys. Pardon? Keys. Well, that's one way. Um, but as a general process, not, not something necessarily specific like keys. Where do you, how do you think about this as a process? I suggest that what you do is you move from the center out. As you move from the center out, you create rings of protection. Um, for instance, if you've got something that's got a public IP that's out there on the internet, you want to restrict root. Remember all of those attempts coming in as root? If they're smart, that's what they're doing. They're trying to do it. So you want to lock down SSH access as quickly as you can. Um, if you haven't already, create a user ID specifically for yourself that's unprivileged because that's what you're going to be logging in with. So you can do all sorts of nifty tricks with your SSHD configuration. If you don't take anything else from this presentation out of this. That first one up there, permit root login, no. The default is yes. Why? I don't know, but it is no. Change it to no. Do not allow root to log in across the network. I can think of no reason that you want to do this. On all my servers, permit root login is set to no. You have to log in as your non-privileged self, and then if you need to do something as root, you either SU or suited to it. Permitted empty password, no. Inside the password field, you can leave the password blank. Don't allow logins with empty passwords. If you want to allow certain users in, you can say allow users, user one, user two, user three, separated by spaces. You want to allow certain groups in that are in your group file. You can allow groups, group one, group two, group three. Similarly, you can also flip it around. There's a deny users and deny groups construct. So that you can say, I want to deny access to group user one, two, three. They can't log in. Same thing with groups. Deny the group. So, yes. wouldn't, at least as I understand least privilege, mm -hmm. your objective should be to start with the most constricted set of resources and expand it as opposed That's to right. go the other way around. Right. Now, it's easy to think that deny groups or deny users might be a good idea, but doesn't it seem like it should be, you should be whitelisting as opposed to attempting to say everyone's right. allowed to except for these. Right. That's why... That's why I have allow users in all groups up there. You're, you're quite listing them this way. But you can flip it around. It may, be, it may be slightly more convenient in your particular setup to deny groups or deny group users. Um, protocol 2. The default is protocol 2 comma 1. You just you want to use SSH protocol 2. 1 had some problems with it. Um, a convenience thing that I like to do is print last log. When you log in successfully, it'll tell you the last time you logged in and from what terminal or what IP address. 
that's very useful. It lets you know if somebody else has tried to get in using your credentials. Log grace time. How long do they have to log in? One minute. I think that's perfectly reasonable. Even a bad a typist as I am, I can usually get logged in in one minute. Okay. You've made these changes, you re you restart your SSH daemon, and now you try another session to see if you can successfully log in. Don't log out and then try to log back in. Nope. I've done that to myself more than once, so there it is. Yes, don't log out. Try it from another session, see if you can get back in. Never make configuration changes and log out. Oh yes, don't make configurations and changes and then log out. Um, if you have messed things up, you can still uh, make changes and hopefully rectify the situation. So once you've got SSH now turned down a, a little bit, update your system. Make sure you're running the latest and greatest software. Run whatever distribution um, updating method you use. There's always there's Yorum, there's RPM, there's App, whatever. Take your pick, depending on what your uh, your particular system is. Okay. You might want to install a firewall. Um, what you want to do with your firewall is, as the gentleman pointed out back there, is you want to start as restrictive as you can be, and then punch holes in as you need them. So I have a set of sample IP tables. It's pretty restrictive. Um, filter. That says this is the filter table. There's other, uh, there's other tables. We'll talk about those in my presentation tomorrow. And then three rules that set policy. Input drop, forward drop, output drop. That's my policy. I'm not allowing anything in or out. So anything that goes in or comes out, I have to punch in myself. Okay? Two rules on input and output that say if it is an established connection, I'm going to allow it to come through. And I do a little trick here. I insert them at one so that I make sure that they are the very first things in my table of rules. Then I allow anything to go across the local interface. I'm going to assume that that's good. Um, depending on your situation in your setup, you may want to send a DHCP request to get DHCP information like an IP address, a network mask, a host name, all that kind of stuff. And this uses 67 and 68 UDP. Okay. Um, set up for DNS. I'm going to allow DNS to go out so that I can resolve important things like Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> um, I'm also going to allow ping requests to go out. Time. It's very important for your computer to know what time it is. So I allow out NTP. I'm going to allow in SSH. So anything that's coming in on uh, a particular interface, notice that I always specify the interface. I'm restricting it by interface. I may have a situation where I have two interfaces or three, but I'm restricting it to one. Um, source port 22. Uh, mail. I may want to send mail out. Let somebody know that something bad has happened. And of course, everybody's favorite. HTTP, HTTPS, and then this says do it. That's my policy. Yes, sir. Will these slides be available later? Oh yes, they're already loaded. They're already uploaded. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, just wondering about uh, listening on port 22. Do you, you know, with a lot of it, my systems, I will force to listen on a different, a non-standard port. So if someone's sure. doing a sweep, is there, is there? reason that maybe you would say not to do that or you think maybe it might not be necessary because you're doing some other measures to yeah. to you know, block to log in and so on and so forth. Um I have that up there just so that it would be a simple I'll example. Sure. Um you know um I have 
I have read things for and against the idea of running SSH on something other than 22. Uh, I've read it both ways. And um, part of the reason I have this up there is, is that in the situation where I am, I have users coming in from all over the world trying to log into our supercomputer. And history has been that they have been told SSH or 22. So I have that legacy that I have to do. And to change to something non-standard, um, I'm going to make a lot of people mad. And it's easier to just say, mitigate port 22 and rather than have all these people mad at me. Um, but yeah, there's there's also... And most protocols leak just a little bit of information that allow you to figure out what's on a port. Well, yeah, if they're doing, if they're doing a reasonably good port scan, they may find 22 anyway. Yeah. Um, I had a lot of material for this presentation, really a lot. And I had to throw stuff away. Most people, they can't figure out how to fill up an hour. Um, one of the things that I did not include in this is something called SPA, Single Packet Authentication. I wanted to talk about that. I had to throw something away. Okay, I'll throw this away. But, if you're interested in that particular subject, uh, go to www.cyperdyne.org and look at FWNOP. Um, okay. Uh, okay, we did, we did HTTP and that's that. Okay. So, you think you're safe. <laughs> You've hardened your SSH demon. You've upgraded your servers. They're running the latest and greatest software. You put in a restricted firewall. What could go wrong now? Lots. Still lots. <coughs> there are lots of bad actors out there who will be trying denial of service attacks against your SSH connection. Or they will be trying to brute force a username and password. No. So, what can you do? There are quite a few tools and techniques to defend against these brute force SSH attacks. One of them, blow your own. I did that. It works good. I found something better. Um, just to talk briefly about that, because I had to leave it. This is another thing I had to leave out. There's something called Simple Event Correlator. Simple Event Correlator is a great program. What I did is I went through the source of the SSH daemon looking for what the error message text strings were. And I wrote these wonderfully complicated Perl regular expressions to detect those strings in my log and then use simple event correlator to say, okay, this guy from this IP address has racked up five of these particular kinds of errors over the past two minutes, so I'm going to block his IP address. It works great, it really does. But it means that I've got to constantly keep up with what's going on in the open SSH daemon for um, strings. And I've got to write these Perl compatible regular expressions. And I don't know how most people feel about regular expressions, but <sighs> tough. Another possibility is to use a program somebody else has written, and they're keeping up with all of this stuff. Fail to ban. Fail to ban is a great program because it's a whole framework. It does, it can do SSH, HTTP, HTTPD. It will look at your Apache logs, your Nginx logs, your XM logs, your mail logs. And depending on how you set the rules up, it can take care of people blasting away with any of these ports. Nighthost is a similar sort of program, except it's just SSH. And then an entirely different mechanism for doing this is called PAM-ABL. PAM-ABL is part of the PAM stack that you can incorporate so that if you get a certain number of login failures from an IP address, you can block that IP address. So it's a completely different mechanism for blocking things off. Um, right now, fail to ban is my favorite, so let's talk a little bit about what it does. Fail to ban is a whole framework based on Python. 
it's got configurations for all of those programs I mentioned and a whole lot more. And it works by looking at the logs that are being generated for errors. And then depending on criteria that you set up, it can block those IP addresses for a certain length of time. Um, and it does this either through using IP tables rules or you can also do it through the TCP routers. I prefer IP tables personally. Um, looking just briefly at the configuration file, um, there's a global default. You can say anything from particular IP addresses you want to ignore. Um, I usually put something in there for my local addresses. I'm going to assume that the uh, people that are on the interior of my address are going to be not doing nefarious things, which is not necessarily true, but I'm going to give them at least a little bit of limited amount of trust. Uh, ban time is how long they will be restricted. I think 10 minutes is too short. If you come knocking on my door too often with the wrong username and password, I think you deserve to be knocked off for at least an hour. Uh, find time and max retry time. That says how long a period of time they have to uh, rack up a certain number of illegal tries. And as I mentioned, fail to ban works for uh, Apache logs, it works for mail logs, it works for lots of different things. Um, we're just going to basically look at a little bit of what you can do with SSH. It's a particular set denoted by SSH tables. And if you look in the configuration file, you can turn on the various features by saying enable equals true or enable equals false. SSHD is the name of the filter. And you can do interesting things. Like, for instance, you can say, IP tables, I want to turn them off through IP tables. It knows how to do that automatically. Um, this is real nice because you can send messages saying, OK, I want you to let me know when bad things are happening, what file to watch, and then you can, over, you can um, overwrite any of the global defaults you set up. For instance, in this case, max retry is set up to be five. Um, one of the things that I didn't mention in the previous slide is that, uh, let me back that one up because I think that's an important little feature to have. Um, it comes with a file called fail to ban <coughs> in a directory, um, jail.com. What I do is I copy that file to jail.local and that's where I make all of my changes. So if a new version of fail to ban comes in, it doesn't overwrite my changes. I just make all the changes to jail.local. I think that's a nice little feature. Okay, so you set up SSH and then you fire up fail to ban and you sit back and wait. So, how do you know that it's working? When fail to ban starts up, that name that you put in there for mail, it sends it a nice little mail, a nice little message saying, Hi, I've started up and this is the particular thing I'm looking at. When you shut it down, it also sends you an email saying, I'm going away now. If you set it up to let you know when something's getting banned, it sends you an email that message like this. It says that this particular IP address has been banned by fail to ban for five attempts. And if it can do a who is lookup, it'll tell you some information about that IP address, which may be useful to you. Like you want to call the administrator of that particular system and say, hi, you've been trying to log, somebody from, your, from you has been trying to log in on my system. Can you please have a talk with them? Okay. Uh, you can also tell that it's working by doing IP tables dash nl. Dash n says don't map ports and IP addresses back to names, just give me the boss stuff. And L says provide me a listing. And there's a IP tables chain set up called fail to ban SSH. And it tells you that these IP addresses have been blocked. They try to connect. After failing, they get a rejection. OK. Everybody good so far? By the way, and as I pointed out, uh, all of this stuff is in the slides, so you don't have to write down the lot. OK. How about a little IP tables voodoo? Some real voodoo. 
Okay, let's say that you want to restrict whoever's coming through to at most four connections at a time. Rather than these guys out there where they just hit you, hit you, hit you, hit you, hit you. Let's cut them down to where they can only have four connections open at a time. This will do it. IP tables add input TCP on send destination port 22. I'm setting up connection limit and if they try more than four, drop them. Boom. That fifth try, boom. That goes in the number. Okay. How about rate limiting them? Rate limiting them. I'm going to rate limit the number of connections you can make in a minute. Now, what, this is an example. I'm going to say that an IP address can have at most 10 connections in 60 seconds, which is actually kind of liberal. It takes two statements to do this. This first one sets the latch. When a new connection comes in, it tells IP tables, okay, record the IP address, record the time it came in on, and hold that. The next one is the one that actually trips the latch. If, they, if IP tables determines that that particular IP address has had more than 10 hits in 60 seconds, boom, gone, no more. Connection, these, these two sets into effect on one of my externally facing servers in the midst of an SSH brute force attack. And it started out like this, and it ramped up and stayed in. And then when I put those two rules in force, boom, gone. Boy, is that effective. I guarantee you this is really effective. It will cut your uh, SSH attacks way down. Okay. When it drops, is it a permanent drop or is there a timer on it? What's the... Um, it's not a permanent drop. Until they back off, they can back off. But then they'll try again and they'll ramp up and they'll drop again. Yeah, it's not a permanent drop. But how long is it for? Um, in this particular case, it would be it would take 60 seconds for them to oh, okay. ramp up again. But usually when bad guys, when that when they start getting rejects like that, they say, okay, this guy's being smart. I'm going to go on to the, it's like that double moat kind of thing. <laughs> oh, gee, this guy's smart. I'm going to go over to, I'm going to go over to his neighbor where the, where the fruit is lower hanging, and I'm going to go after him. Does it drop the sessions that were already open? Mm -hmm. So only new ones. That's, that's the, that's the beautiful part about this. Is this is new sessions. New sessions, not old sessions. Old sessions, but... Not new ones. This just slows down the attack of that. This oh, yeah, and that's how we're... This doesn't actually mitigate the brute force attack. No, it doesn't really. It, it slows them down. down. It slows them down. It makes you, it makes you less desirable fruit. You're getting the 90%. Yeah, yeah this, is, this is hitting the 90%. Yeah, strip kitties. Um, China. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, not, not, to be, not to be impolite about our, our Oriental friends, but China. I have got, in, in, in the time that I have been running these, these external servers, I have got to be very good at just looking at an IP address and say, China. <laughs> seriously. Seriously. Um, what, what, like I said, I had to throw away a lot of material for this. One of the things you can do with IP tables is that you can block by country. There is a technique to do that. I wish I could share that with you, but I had to throw something away, so I did. Okay. Um, so, um, there's a way to block by a country. So you can say, da 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 da, if this is the country code CN, which is China, drop them. Gone. It works. It's not terribly complicated, but it can be done. Yes, sir. Is that awesome kind of IP who is look up on there? You just say IP no. block for the country. Um, so there is a, there, there's a, well, I'm going to talk about this, but just to answer your question real quickly. There's a company called MaxMind. MaxMind provides uh, a free table, updated once a month, and you can buy their service. But they provide a table that maps 
IP address to country code. You take that table and go through a little bit of magic, and you can say, add input, new connection, country code, CN, drop. They're gone. You can block an entire country that way. Um, you can block, in fact, you can string them together and say CN, comma, RU, comma, whatever, and drop whole blocks of countries that way. Pardon? Those, those two will probably go take chunks. Yeah, then, you know, that'll, that'll keep away a whole bunch of stuff right there with just blocking uh, uh, China and Russia. But yeah, that, that was that was unfortunately something that I didn't talk about, but I didn't talk about that anyway. But yeah, that can be done. You can block, you can use IP cables to block all my country code base, which is really cool. Or turn that around if it's a whitelist, right? Well, just allow certain. Well, that is also true because you can, you can also say, okay, I'm only going to allow U.S. You can also say, I, I want to allow only U.S. Um, along those lines, along those lines. This is another thing I had to drop, but I'm talking about it anyway, so why not? Um, <laughs> if you are running a Debian version of Linux you can actually restrict what operating system you can allow to connect to you. <laughs> you can't do it with Red Hat or anything that's derived from Red Hat, but you can do it with Debian, anything derived from Debian, which includes Ubuntu and all these other things. You can actually say, I'm only going to allow connections from Linux. Yes. Or, or by the reverse token, you can say, I'm not going to allow any Windows computer to connect to me. <laughs> Yes, sir. Can you restrict that down to the kernel version at all? Or is it <laughs> <laughs> oh, as far as I remember, no. You, you, it's either, it's, it's a, it's so a, by, it's by a has a built-in way to Yes. Um, it's probably, I mean, NMAP has always had the ability well, to do NMAP a fingerprint. Well, NMAP has always had that capability. And probably just reverse engineering, a, whatever that does. There, there was a previous, a much earlier program called P0F which stood for Passive OS Fingerprinter. Um, I've used POF a lot uh, for various different things, but basically all of that, that technique is of blocking, by blocking the, the uh, operating system is all technology that came out of P0F. Um, the, the deal on P0F is that there are standards for TCP, but there's a lot of wiggle room in TCP. And Depending on the way a computer system communicates with you, you can make guesses about what OS it is based on things like time to live and various bits that are said in the initial handshake, things like that. That's what this code does, is that it uses those fundamental properties of TCP to determine what the computer on the other side is, and you can block by that OS or PIP permit by the by that OS, for instance. And so, you know, that's very useful. You may only want to permit Linux systems to connect you. You're not interested in Windows at all. Cut them off the knees. Um, but yeah, that, that's sure another another mitigation technique. Just make sure you have the authority to make that decision. What's that? <laughs> Just make sure you have the authority to make that yeah, decision. Yeah, make sure that you have the authority. It's all fun and games to, until your uh, research director is at a conference in Russia and can't get into a super. Uh, yeah, yeah, well. Uh, I don't think our research director would be coming in from Russia, but a a anyway, but um, um, I have done fingerprinting now on a particular system I have on the internet for a number of years now, and it is very interesting to see what has been what OSs have been connecting to me. Um, it, it's it's amusing to just look at that, but that that's another mitigation technique that you can do. Is you can you can also block by by the OS that's coming in. Um, how do you know that this those rules that you just put in have been working? Those that I had just in the previous slide. Um, run this little shell script, assuming that your server is 192, 101, 100, 101. Uh, it just blasts a whole bunch using netcat at it, and after the first few. All of a sudden, you'll see all of these connection rejection messages saying, I can't do it. So you can use this to make sure that it's actually fundamentally working. Okay. Quick question. 
Yes, sir. Would you, want, would you normally want to do a rejection or just a drop? Because I, I hear different discussions. A lot of people just want to drop. Uh, it so. depends on what your policy is. Okay. Uh, you may want to drop. I just want to reject. It, it gives the attacker no indication that you're even still yeah. there if you drop. Yeah. So, yeah. Drop just says unceremoniously go away. But in, but in this particular case, where they've been trying for a few times, they already know something's there. Uh, so reject works fine. It just unsure, it just poof, gone. Okay, maybe they'll come back, maybe they won't. But <coughs> this stuff is still there. After four times, boom, drop them on four. Yes, sir. The trick question re reject, the difference is it sends an ICP unreachable or something? Yeah, you can kind of do that. Uh, is that what it does by default? Pardon? Is that what it does by default? Is that what it does with the post of ICMP and reachable back? Or? Uh, well, you well they've already made a connection to you, so ICMP uh, unreachable doesn't really make any sense. You might as well just do a reject and, and drop them on the floor. Um, okay. What have we got so far? Pardon SSHD. We've patched. We've put in a firewall. We put in all sorts of interesting mitigation attempts to cut down on bad guys hitting you with SSH. We're cool now, right? It's Miller time. Wrong. Wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. There's lots more nasty stuff out there. Yes, indeed. This is a list that I compile from one of my servers out there on the internet. What's at the top? SQL injection. How long have SQL injections been going on? Since there was SQL. Since there was, yes, exactly. <laughs> Since there was SQL. Why do people still try SQL injection? Because it works. It works. <laughs> exactly. It works. People try it because it works. Microsoft Terminal Server. Another one. It works. VNC. It works. PC Anywhere. Plug and Play. All of these works. And this is just a list in decreasing order that I got off of one of my servers. That they're trying. What can you do to prevent this kind of stuff happening? Now, if you're just running SSH out there on the wrong box, you probably don't care about this at all. If you've got SSHs, all you've got, what we've done so far is more than enough. But I don't know very many servers out there that just run SSH. I have some customers, plus their hearts, that run some really off the wall software and it's got huge numbers of ports open. So I need to mitigate beyond just SSH. But SSH was all I had for these guys. Life would be simple. Not these guys. And they're inter and they have international users too. So that only makes it even worse. Okay. All of this stuff you've done. What can you do about some of this? You need some sort of intrusion or detection and protection system that will detect all of these various kinds of attacks and do something against it. Well, first of all, if you're not running that stuff, don't leave the ports open. That's true. That's very true. But, yeah, that was the reason for having that particular list of firewall stuff, is that I've only punched through what I need. But, Okay, a classic example here of people not thinking about the way their software should work. Um, those people that I were referring to, some of my customers, uh, they recently put up a new piece of software and they needed a, um, a particular range of ports open, TCP 6000 to 6100. What's that? That's X display. Okay, that's bad because that leads to X session hijacking. But the software doesn't run, it's not X. They just happen to pick a bad range of ports. So what's going to happen? The bad guys are going to try X hijacking session attempts against this particular piece of software. So I need to mitigate against that kind of thing. That was a really bad choice on the part of the developer. Um, and other software they run has a really wide range of ports. Um, so you need some sort of intrusion detection and protection system. Um, so just on that, an X hijacker wouldn't do anything. It'd just be an annoyance, right? Maybe, maybe. 
if it was just an annoyance, it would be great. More than likely, it's going to be input that the software, the server, the other uh, on, on my end would not know how to handle it. Crash. We, we, you know, everybody writes perfect software. They get input. To, everybody does input validation. Everybody does input link validation. Hmm. Not. Right. <laughs> Maybe in an alternative universe they do. <laughs> not here. The, the best that could happen is, is that the server would say, I don't know what this is and toss it away. Worst case, the server dies. My money is on server time. <laughs> um, I've put up intrusion detection systems before. Um, it's a lot of work. It really is a lot of work. Um, first time you put one up, your boss comes to you and says, how's that intrusion detection system going? Oh, it's going great. <laughs> and you hide. It's going to take you at least a month to refine things down. It'd be nice if you had an easier way to do this. And that way is using this. Port Scan Activity Detector, PSAD. It comes from www.cyberdyne.com. PSAD looks at your logs and based on rules that you define can detect and mitigate against a whole range of attacks. FW Snort is a really cool program. It takes snort rules, and there are tens of thousands of snort rules for all kinds of network attacks, and turns those into IP tables rules. Now, it, there are some snort rules that don't translate exactly, but it does a very good job and gets about 75%, which is really good coverage. Now, when you combine PSAD and FW Snort, which are, by the, by the way, written by the same guy, and NetFilter matching, you can, PSAD will look at your logs, determine what is happening, and generate IP tables rules to block those badness coming in. And it can do it for, I, for IP, before IP, IPv6. You can also do it through TCP wrappers, but I prefer um, using uh, IP tables, just personal choice. Um, lots of things aren't linked against TCP wrappers, so that's why I use IP tables. Um, you can set up various danger levels based on the number of incidences of, of badness that you see. And they range from 1 to 5, and you can store them. Um, just talking about PSAD is probably a whole... Um, uh, session in itself. Okay, uh, you've got PSAD running. This is what some output from it looks like. It tells you the top 50 signature matches, and I cut a lot of this stuff down just to cut down the number of slides. Um, tells you the top 25 attackers, top 25 uh, scan ports for both TCP and UDP. I cut out some of it so that it all fit on the slide because um, when you have PSAD running, and it's running on a live network connection out there on the internet. It doesn't take long. It fills up a lot. Um, and it doesn't take much itself. Um, if you have mitigation turned on, you have auto blocking turned on, um, it will tell you what IP tables, uh, what uh, IP addresses it has blocked. And you can set it up so that if somebody has continuing badness, it blocks them forever. They won't get in. Um, you can also whitelist systems too. Um, gives you some some counts there, uh, and then it gives you a uh, more detailed account. Like for instance, uh, this particular bad guy has scanned this set of IP, uh, this particular port range. What the uh, type was? Oh, guess what? Terminal server what interface it came in on, um, and a sort, a snort signature ID. Okay. Yes, sir? I often hesitate to employ something that defense uh, attacks rather than just detects them because I'm always worried about 
uh, someone getting a little clever with this to launch up the denial of service attack, like mm -hmm. intentionally triggering some of these rules. So what's, what's your experience with that? Is that something like a common problem you encounter when you're doing these kind of measures? Or? Actually, no. I have not come across that problem yet. Um, it seems like 99, or 90, at least 99% of this junk that I see is just plain old stupidity out there blasting away. Um, people blasting away, trying to get in on SSH or uh, any number of other ports trying to find vulnerabilities. Uh, they're not being very smart about it. Um, the distributed not denial of service, no, I, I don't see that. Um, the last time I saw a real DDoS attack was over Christmas, and when was that? That had it been, was that 2009? No, that was earlier. Well, actually, I mean, I'm kind of referring yeah. to something, not necessarily a distributed attack, but someone where someone will say, where someone will determine, uh, um, I just tried, you know, some kind of <coughs> attack vector, and I noticed that now this IP is blocked. Mm -hmm. So now I can use this to intentionally trigger the block to prevent legitimate traffic from 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 getting in, you know, as, as a like, more focused denial. Yeah, and yeah. Yeah. Um, most of the way that I've constructed this is so that rather than blocking a whole, a whole service, I'm trying to cut it off on an IP basis, IP address basis, so I'm pretty safe there. Just being granular. Right? Just being Right, the trick is being as granular as you possibly can be. If you noticed in those, for instance, in those rules, those that block of IP tables, as I had an example, I map it down to a particular interface. Uh, so that the, the more granularity you can put in there, the, the better. Um, the general rule, if you're doing anything with IP tables, is very specific up at the top, very general down at the bottom. Um, and if you come to my talk tomorrow at 11 p.m., 11 a.m., on IP tables, tips and, tips and tricks, we'll talk more about that. Um, okay. Got all this stuff in place now. Boy, have we got stuff in place. We are mitigated all over the place. What happens <clears throat> next? Possibly the worst thing that can happen. Your boss comes to you and says, or you think, you know, I've got all this stuff in place. How do I know it's working? How do I know it's effective? Your boss or you want some kind of reports. Now, the problem with doing any kind of security reporting is what do I want to represent? How do I represent it? That ends up being a real problem. Now, one of the things that you can do, since we've got all of these logs being generated, is you can write a real simple little awk program, or program, or Python, <coughs> and take those logs of all of these IP addresses that are being blocked, and, well, uh, SSA blocks. Let's talk about SSA blocks. You've got usernames in that log. You can write a real simple little program. You can just pulls all of those names out and then does frequency count. So that you can say, okay, this is my top IP, top name they're using, second, top, third, top, fourth, top. Make a nice little table and hand that to your boss and say, here's the, here's the, um, here's the usernames that people are trying to come in on. Well, that's nice. You can make it in text, and then you can pull it into some sort of word processing program, and maybe stick it into some sort of uh, program that does spreadsheets, and maybe manip manipulate it that way. But how about if you could do something visual? <coughs> Pluses love visual. Pardon? Pluses love visual. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, one of the things that I have discovered in my uh, workings as uh, both a roving consultant and a, and a permanent employee is that bosses, that there's, there's two types of, uh, of there's engineer, engineers and geeks and bosses. 
<laughs> Engineers and geeks love plots. They love plots. String out time across the bottom, some value across the top, make some kind of a line. Great stuff. The bosses look at that, you know, their, their mouth hangs open. On the other hand, bosses love pie charts. <laughs> if you can put something for a boss in a pie chart, they will love it. They understand pie charts. Why? Because it's food. <laughs> they understand food. They can look at the pie chart and say, oh, this big slice here. I understand that. This is a resource. It's over 50%. Wow. I can understand it because it's food. They understand food very well. Okay. So let's do something visual. Let's that the table that we had of all of those uh, all of those names. One of my favorite programs that I ran across is the IBM Word Cloud Generator, free software. It's Java. IBM Word Cloud Generator. It's a Java application, and it will produce an image based on a file of data that you give it. And it gives preponderant prominence to words that appear more frequently in the source text. Now, why do we pursue an education and get advanced degrees? We do not get it because we like to enlighten ourselves. We do not do it so that we can make more money. We do not do it for personal gratification. We do it so that we can stand up in front of a room and use the phrase predominant pro prominence and not get laughed at. Well, what it does is that you just put all of, those, all of those names in a file, one per line, feed that into it, and it's got a nice little configuration file that you can set up, and it will produce a word cloud based on all of those names. And it's pretty simple to invoke. And in this particular one, I'm using Macbeth as input to play Macbeth. And it will produce a word cloud based on Macbeth. But instead of using Macbeth, let's take that list of usernames. And we just have to go through and just pull every name out. We don't have to do any kind of transmogrification to count them up. It will do that for us, one per line. Feed that into word count generator. Now, the file that I use to generate this next word cloud I threw out a root, because root is the thing they're going to use the most. Root is uninteresting. I know they're going to try root, but let's see what they did try. Bingo. <laughs> Oracle. Is that surprising? Oracle. <coughs> Sale. Test. Test one. Jack. My sequel. All sorts of things. Wow. Cisco. Simply fine. I don't understand that one. <laughs> uh, Hatmatic? No idea about that. But you, you see, you can immediately tell what names they're using the most, and it jumps out at you. It's really great for presentation. Now, let's take this idea of taking the usernames and plugging that into a word file. Except now, let's run our program that scoops this out. And let's capture both the username and append the IP address that it came from. Maybe separated by something like dash. So that now we have username dash IP address that it came from. And let's run that through word file. <coughs> and what do we get? We get this. Ooh. Wow. Oracle is still top. But it's all coming from one. But you see, look at how many we're getting all from the same IP address. We've now added an extra dimension in there just by adding and tacking on the IP address to the name, running that through WordCloud. <coughs> and we see that this 192, 96, 206, 223, they're really hitting us a lot. And they're hitting us with a lot of usernames. Um, one of the things that we can identify through this is that um, 
This one tried Oracle, but so did this one, and a lot too. So we managed to expand things out and get a much better idea about things. Um, we can look at this and see which IP addresses are really getting hit us, hitting us a lot. We can see um, the usernames that they're using, which ones are the ones they're particularly using a lot. Okay, um, so now the question comes up. We've got all of these IP addresses that we can see here. Where are these IP addresses coming from? Wouldn't that be nice to know? To know who you're being hit by. Um, not necessarily all of them come from Russia and China. A lot of them do. Um, uh, as one of my colleagues says, how do you spell how do you spell D O S? You spell it C H I N A. <laughs> How about if we could somehow or the other convert an IP address to a location? MaxMind is a commercial company. They sell databases of mapping IP addresses to countries. They have a database that you can buy, it's not terribly expensive, that will map an IP address even down as far as street level. Uh, um, this is particularly good for companies that take online orders and are trying to prevent fraud. But they distribute a free version of their database that doesn't have nearly the resolution, but it can get down to state and county level um, for like the US, and province level for other places in the world. It's updated once a month. If you buy their service, you can get it daily. Uh, the software comes with lots of different interfaces to their database. I prefer the all Perl version. You just say Perl, Perl program name, IP address, database, or the database of, boom, it will tell you that, remember that 192.96.206.223 address that was so prominent in our word cloud? It turns that into Manassas, Virginia. NSA. <laughs> no, no, that's not, that's not, that's not, that's not for where they are. That's not where they are. Uh, if it were Langley, I'd say CIA, but Manassas, I don't know. Anyway, it turns it into a latitude and longitude. With a little bit of work, you could turn it into a table like this. Here's the IP address range, latitude, longitude, city. You can map it that far. Um, state, uh, and or a province number, if it can match that far. Um, county, um, or country. California, if it's a state, if it can match it to the United States. Um, it's interesting to just look through this after you've converted it and see all the places that have been hitting you. You can pull that into a table, put that into a word processor, print it off and give it to your boss. And he goes, oh wow, this is really neat. But, no pizzazz. <laughs> no panache. Something better. There's a program called XGeolocate. It's a Python program. And there's a reason why I have this format this particular way. It's because this is what the input you put into XGeolocate looks like. And it will take this information here and turn that into a world plot that looks like this. Oh boy. I'm getting hit from all over the place. I've even seen Iceland. I've even been hit from Iceland. I've never been seen anything from Antarctica. <laughs> They're too busy staying warm. Um, as you might guess, a lot of Southeast Asia. There's Moscow, Central Russia, New Delhi. Um, that's Gatlin, no, that's Leeds, England there. Um, that's some place in France. I've forgotten the, the name of that particular one. But you can play all sorts of tricks with XGeolocate. I just made red square, red circles with, with a black border. What you can do is you can take your those that table. And as you're creating it, create a whole bunch that say 
hits you a thousand to five thousand times. And I'm going to create my table, put this into XGeolocate, and I'm going to give that um, a red, a red color. And then I'm going to go down to the next level, say 500 to 999. I'm going to make that yellow, and then I feed that in, and so on and so on down. So that you can create different heat levels within XGeolocate. I just did this as a real simple thing to give you the idea. You can also do something with size. You can also specify what size you want it to end up being. So that maybe what you want to do is the places that hit you the most have a slight that have hit you the most have a smaller profile than something that hits you a lot so that you don't get occlusion. But you can play with it. This Python, it's a great program. And it's of course it's free. Um, remember we were talking about PSAD, port scan activity detector? PSAD has an interface to GNU plot. So, you can use PSAD to parse your IP table's block plots. And it will generate a data file and a description file in GNU plot for you. So you don't really have to understand how GNU plot works. Um, you can do all different kinds of counting modes. You can count by minute, count by hour, count by day, count by month, count by year. Um, there's a whole bunch of uh, criteria for counting. You can graph based on the input field names that are in your IP tables. For instance, source port, destination port, um, source IP, destination IP. Um, and I just have this little proviso down here that uh, it works best um, if you're plotting by IP address. Uh, it assigns a number to that IP address. So you got to look back in the file to see, okay, number 51, that corresponds to this IP address, but um, that's just a little aside. Okay. Um, I take a month's worth of my IP tables logs of um, stuff that has been coming across and has been dropped. So I want to see what my activity looked like for a particular month. So, what I do is I use PSAT to parse it. That creates two files. I say GNU plot. Uh, description file name is already embedded the, uh, the name in there. And I've told it to um, count hits by hour. And I for a month, and then I get this. Oh! I've been hit here, hit here, here. And here. And hmm, very repeatable. Somebody's been hitting me a lot on a regular span. So what I can do now is that I can go back and look at this particular time and section that out and get more detailed information. That's just one of the plots. This is the count unique by hour, and I was just interested in saying. Let's see what my activity is over a month. Now another example. I look at my IP tables logs and I notice, boy, hmm, huh, I'm getting hit on this one particular port from this one particular address a lot. Turns out it was UDP 8612. Rather uncommon port. I look it up and that tells me that it's the something for Canon printers. Well, that's kind of weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they're trying to they're trying to launch some attack to see if they can uh, suborn some uh, printer and use that against me. I look up. I use the Max Mind stuff to determine where it's coming from, and I determine it's coming from Gdansk, Poland. Okay. So I start thinking. Okay. Now, let's go back and produce a plot. Let's see what kind of regularity this guy's been hitting me with. So what did I do now is I feed that from PSAT, use PSAT to parse the table, run that through the new plot, and then this. Hmm. Oh boy, he's been hitting me a lot, and very regularly. And as it turns out, he was also hitting me when I got that one of those large spikes. Okay. Pretty neat. Okay. Winding up. 
lots of bad actors out there, and they're using FUD's first law of opposition to get into your systems. Conversely, there's a lot of open source tools and techniques that you can use to mitigate these uh, bad actors away. You have to assess your own risk profile and apply whatever is appropriate. You may not have to do all of this, but there is a wide range of stuff you can do depending on what your particular risk profile is and how secure you feel and what your field of risks are. Okay. References. This is all in my slides. They're up on the site. What's first law of opposition? Does anybody remember Five Sign Theater at all? Nobody? Yes, sir. Congratulations. <laughs> hey, we're all bozos on this bus. Um, SSHD configuration. Um, there's a man page for that. IP tables at netfilter.org. Fail to ban is at fail to ban.org. And I host if you want to try that. Pam. Uh, Pam Stack One. Pam ADL. He said and started from Cyperdyne. Uh, Word cloud generator is free from IBM. There's a site for that. GeoIP is at MaxMind. It's GeoLocate, a program that generates a nice plot file. And the new plot. There's a new plot info. So, questions. I'm sure lots of questions. You're all asleep from the food. <laughs> yes, sir. Have you ever used an integrated seam solution? Yes, I did have. Uh, I use a, a, there's a SIM solution that I use called, this uh, called Prelude IDS. Uh, if you go to www.prelude-ids.org, you can get information from it there. What I use particularly um, uh, is the uh, Prelude Correlator Engine and a thing called Prelude LML. LML stands for Log Monitoring Lackey. Uh, it looks for patterns in the log file. But that, that's the SIM that I use. Uh, again, open source, open source software. Um, it, the, the ramp up time on it is a little bit high. Yeah. But um, I think it's worth it. There is something like, like um, OSIM, which is another open source. Yeah. But it has a performance issue. <laughs> I, I am not. I am not a fan of OSIM. Uh, it's way too hard to set up. Yeah, it's taking me a long time. It, it's it's way, way, way too hard to set up. Um, you, you could probably, a, co a colleague of mine in another, in another installation spent probably a year setting up OSIM. Okay. Uh, it's, it's very hard to set up. Um, I, if, if you need something quick, don't go that route. Um, Okay. 